Good evening. Welcome to Kansas Legislature on Smoky Hills Public Television. I'm Larry Dryling. I'm an adjunct professor of digital journalism and agriculture at Fort A. State University. I'm also a policy fellow of the Docking Institute of Public Affairs at Fort Hayes State. Can, our uh, hosting tonight is uh, part of our regular duties here in the Docking Institute to discuss the major issues of the day in the state of Kansas. With us tonight on the Kansas Legislature, four members of the Legislature, one Kansas Senator, three state representatives. First, on my right and to your left, Senator Rick Billinger of Goodland in the, his third stint in the Legislature, first as a Senator representing District 40. He chairs the Corrections Subcommittee of the Ways and Means Committee. Also on Ways and Means, he chairs the Labor and Human Rights Subcommittee. He's Vice Chairman of the Joint Committee on State Building Construction, the uh, Financial Institutions and Insurance, and of the Total Ways and Means Committee, he is the Vice Chairman. He also serves on several other subcommittees on the Ways and Means Committee. To my left and to your right, Representative Brad Ralph of Dodge City in his second term in the Kansas Legislature, representing District 119. He serves as chairman of the Joint Committee on Special Claims Against the State and is vice chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He also serves on the Rules and Journal Committee, the Committee on Commerce, Labor, and Economic Development, the Appropriations Committee, and he also served on a 2017 Special Committee on Commerce. Also to my far right and to your far left, Representative Barbara Wassinger of Hayes in her first term representing District 111. She serves on taxation, financial institutions and pensions, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules and Regulations, and the Higher Education Budget Committee. And to my far left and to your far right, Representative Susan Kincannon of Beloit in her fourth term representing District 107. She is the chair of the Committee on Children and Seniors. She serves on the Taxation Committee, an Appropriations Committee, and a committee dear to my heart because a gentleman who uh, once uh, sat on these chairs many years ago, a dear guy, uh, the Robert G. Bob Bethel, Joint Committee on Home and Community-Based Services and Can Care Oversight Committee. And that is our uh, panel for tonight. One thing tonight, you are welcome to be a part of this show. Please call us at 1-800-337-4788. That's 1-800-337-4788. We'll be taking your calls in just a little bit. But first, we want to talk about a few issues, primarily taxation, taxation, taxation. <laughs> and the guy that we really need to speak to here, because it's so front-loaded in the Kansas Senate, is Rick Billinger. Rick, we've had two major uh, uh, I guess you would call them bills placed into the Senate. Uh, first of all, we've had a Senate Select Committee on the Federal Tax Code. Uh, and it's passed the full Senate, a $400 million plus three-year tax cut package in response to President Trump's federal tax cuts of 2017. Tell us about it a little bit. Well, I don't serve on tax, uh, okay, Larry, but, this, but, but, but here's what I can tell you okay. that I do But because know. you're a senator, I need, sure. I need to know because this has been so sure. front-loaded. Sure. Well, uh, you know, there's really three parts to the, to the legislation. You know, there's one part that deals with the folks that don't take uh, itemized deductions. They take the standard deduction. Those folks won't be affected at all because they'll continue to take the standard deduction. They're getting a, a larger standard deduction at the federal level now, so they're going to get some money back from the federal government. It's going to help those folks quite a bit. We also have the folks in the, in the center that are deducting today. They're deducting their mortgage. They're deducting their charitable contributions. They're deducting their health care expense. And they are going to fall kind of in the center there where if we don't decouple, they will no longer be able to take these deductions. And if they're not able to take these deductions because it's, it's going to be more advantageous for them to take that large standard federal deduction. Yeah. Okay. And that's going to hurt a lot of, and that's going to hurt a lot of charities. Oh it? yeah, it'll, 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 it'll hurt that. And, and you know, some folks get uh, put into a real pinch 
on health care. You know, if they can't afford uh, to deduct them expenses, it's, it's really going to be uh, devastating to them also. And then the third, the third group are the larger folks that itemize. They'll continue to itemize. They have enough. They have that 25000 and it's, it's no problem to them. So it's the folks in the middle that are going to be impacted most by this tax deduction. Now the numbers, I, you said 400 million. I, I'm not sure that they know what the numbers are. Okay. And, and, and generally, you know, we, we're not getting this money today. We're not getting yeah. any of this money. So this money will start coming in. It's a guess how much it would be if we took it and, and, and the state kept it. Right now, they have not figured any money in. So you can't figure any money out. I mean, yeah. it's, it's tough. S somebody, somebody told me that it's basically kind of squishy. Is right. a good term for it. It's right. The whole thing is squishy. Anybody got to react to that comp concept? Well, it's always. A, I think it's always a challenge for in the, in the legislative services and, and all of the staff folks do a, do a really good job of trying to get us the information when they can. But that's asking a lot of those folks when you don't have any hard information coming in. So to just be talking about estimates, you know, whether you're talking about a three-year anticipation on the revenue or or a one-year, pretty difficult for for them to to get us something that that you can really rely on. So you end up getting squishy numbers. Yeah, yeah, and you know, some the, the bill. Some people say that this is going to have a rather outsized cost to the state, and that's something that Governor Kelly is not terribly fond of. And how? So how are we going to get this well, here, past, here, past here, here, a Democratic a, governor? Well, and here, and I don't know uh, if she'll sign it or won't sign it, but hopefully she will. But the, the truth of the matter is, today we're getting zero. We're not getting any of this money today, you know. And if we don't decouple, this money will come in on the back of this these folks in the center. You know, if you're a small business guy, let's say you're a plumber and you bought a new trencher and you, you want to itemize that, you want to itemize a, a lot of different things, they may fall into this where they'll be taking that larger standard deduction and won't be able to itemize. And, and this will be money coming to us that we've never ever had. And, well, procedurally, uh, it, it did, it started in the Senate, uh, and, but um, we have been taking a look at it on the tax yes. committee on the House side. We've, uh, we've had hearings, informational hearings on the different pieces of it. And there are two choices. You either raise, there's some, well there are actually more than two, but one choice is to <laughs> raise ahead. the standard deduction for Kansas to try to make up that difference or decouple and let people in Kansas do itemized deductions. The issue with that is that Kansas has never had any enforcement of itemized deductions. They've always used the IRS to do that. And now that people won't be doing that on their federal taxes, it'll be up to the state of Kansas to figure out who's telling the truth and who isn't. Yeah, and, there's, and, and that's basically where the, where the controversy is. It's, just, it's everybody's kind of confused right now more than anything else. It, that's, that's exactly that's what answer. we're hearing. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's go to some calls because We've actually got calls right here at eight minutes after the hour. Joe from Central Kansas, you're live on Kansas Legislature. Go ahead. Where in Central Kansas are you, first of all? Because Central Kansas can be anywhere. Anywhere. Joe? Hello, Joe. Joe Joe went to Kokomo, I guess. Hello, Joe. We missed him. Okay, can we get Joe in Liberal? That's the second. We'll get to Joe and Liberal now. Okay, Joe and Liberal. Joe and Liberal, are you there? Yes. I'm okay, here. welcome to Kansas Legislature. Go ahead with your question. My question is, my question is, I'm having trouble to qualify for any type of uh, state uh, assistance due to my uh, income. Yeah, and and what's and what's the specific issue that you need to talk to a legislature, a legislator about? Under, under the LEAP program, there is a limit that you can make for two people, and that's seventeen hundred and forty-eight dollars. Now, unfortunately, I'm over that by three hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. I don't qualify for the LEAP, and I don't qualify for the SNAP program. Okay, and and so what are we? What what specifically? Do you want to see changed?
Maybe he's wanting to make, Maybe he's make just, that a higher limit so yeah, he would Yeah, I guess he's probably it. I guess he wants a higher limit. Uh, do we have any? Uh, we don't have any callers right now. Okay. Let, you know, and I think we were talking about confusion here more than anything <laughs> else. And, you know, and so where are we going here on this? What do, what do you see? Because it's, it's happening probably either Wednesday or Thursday. Have, you haven't really even seen the full bill yet, have you? No, they just passed it out uh, yesterday, I believe, and I, and I haven't had an opportunity to look at it yet. But uh, uh, I, I don't know how quick, uh, if we'll work it next week or not. I mean, that's kind of been talked about, but uh, I think until there's some numbers, and maybe they'll have numbers by Monday or Tuesday, I don't know. And the, the, from what I was hearing, it was either going to be Wednesday or Thursday that you guys were going to be going to be putting the vote on it. Okay. Well, I think we heard on taxation that the Department of Revenue doesn't have the numbers yet at all. And so it's it's hard to make decisions based on nothing. Well, yeah, this is, this is the one thing that Senate President Waggle, Susan Waggle, was saying that she didn't she didn't have it either. But uh, it, it turns out, again, this confusion because the corporate tax changes in the federal income mm -hmm. hasn't been dealt with because of the general compliance with the federal law. So that's, again, confusion. Are you confused? Yes, we all are. I <laughs> and I think we'll, we'll continue to have some confusion in this regard. They came out, just mm -hmm. before I got here, saw that they just came out with some new revenue numbers and those were, were down underneath estimates at the, at, for the end of January at this point. So that's going to continue to put some pressure on what our overall situation is going to be and talking about uncertainty and squishiness again. Squishiness, that's a good term anyway. <laughs> oh boy, I created a monster. Yes, you did. <laughs> Squishy, okay, well, that's who it is. Uh, uh, Jerry from Abilene. Jerry from Abilene. You're the next caller on Kansas Legislature. Go ahead. Well, good evening and thank you for doing this this evening. It's a wonderful service to the public. My question specifically is what you've already addressed a little bit, and that is the fiscal note attached to this particular uh, deduction that's being addressed. You know, in our rural communities, many of these things are not being uh, drafted down into the rural communities and so i would like since you're all rural community uh, representatives how do you think this is going to work thank you very much thank you uh anybody want to take this after all it's been saying that the fiscal notes show the bills cost at about a hundred and like i said about 191 million dollars uh with the tab falling to about 122 billion, 122 million, pardon me, in 21, and 117 the following year. And according to one story I saw, uh, President Weigel said the fiscal notes are being honed by the Department of Revenue to give the lawmakers a clearer idea just what effect this bill will have on the state. Well, any any thought here? My, my thought is is that we've never ever collected. There shouldn't be a fiscal note at all. I mean, we, we've never had anything. So I mean, if you've never had it in. There's nothing going out. I mean, it's they, they cross each other out. I mean, if, if the way I okay, let's the way just, I'm getting this. Let me let me ask you just this question right now. Just by what you've heard and what you've seen so far, where are you ready to tip on this? Yes or no? Are you ready to go? Oh, I, I haven't even looked at the legislation. <clears throat> I need to look at that and, and read it through and see if you know what the impacts would be if there are. Some I'm sorry to corner you here, but you <laughs> no, know that's no, that's and that's, I, but it's yeah. the way it is here. You right. know. No, I haven't. I haven't had an opportunity to look at these gals. Are at least are on on tax, so they've seen. They've seen more bit. than I have. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, we, have, we, what have you seen? What have you seen? Well, we've seen pieces of it, and but um, you know, I, it'll be. When it gets over to the house, it'll be like everything we do. We'll sit down you're, you're and study at, it and, and and mash and it up again. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do what we can to make it to make it a better bill. Let's see what happens. That's right. So we, just, we will. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. Okay, uh, Nick from Victoria. Nick from Victoria, you are live on Kansas Legislature. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you guys is taking my call. And uh, I've just got a couple of questions. They're kind of budget related. Um, in the recent years, you know, there's been some real changes with state employment. You know, the classified, unclassified issue. I know that's been coming up recently. And also, if you look at the number of openings on the state website, it is substantial. Mm. And I don't know if there's anything that 
the legislature is thinking about doing to address that issue. You know, there's the CAPERS issue. And just in general, a lot of the agencies seem to have a lot of problems related to some of the financial issues. What types of things are being looked at to resolve some of those issues? Rick, I was just getting ready to, if we, were, if we didn't have any more calls, I was just getting ready to, to ask you about this bill called SB9, which is going to authorize the transfer of $115 million from the state general fund to CAPERS. Uh, in the next fiscal year. Let's talk about that a little bit. Okay, uh, you know, and, and one of the things, this might help employment because if, if folks know that the, they join the the, uh, the Kansas uh, employment side of things, that if they put money into the retirement fund, CAPERS, that they will, will be assured that they'll re get that return when they retire. And Senate Bill 9, what this bill does is in 2016, we were short funds and so we skipped the, the final payment of capers and it and we promised in 2016 that we would pay that back with interest in 2018 well last year <coughs> last year when we finished the budget rightfully so we were cautious because we wanted to make sure the revenues were in good shape mm -hmm. so we we didn't feel like we could make it so we didn't make it so our promise was we would make that in 2018, it was not made. This is costing us $630,000 a month for not making this. So far, it's cost us $18,900,000. And if we don't get something done here, hopefully we'll get it. We're, we're working that bill Monday. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm carrying that bill Monday mm -hmm. on the floor. Mm -hmm. And once we get that through the Senate, get it over to the House, and hopefully get it to the governor. Hopefully we can get this in law before we get to $20 million. That's my hope. Well, yes. Any, any, well, anybody else have a thought on that? Well, uh, one thing I do know is that the director of CAPERS came to the um, pension mm -hmm. uh, committee and said there are no concerns about the trust fund. The trust fund itself has not been touched. So there's money to pay every benefit that needs to go out. And one of the problems with um, uh, the employment of the state is we have very low wages. So there's so much that we have to look at and try to cut some in some places to maybe move some money over. It's all, all this budget is just needs to be dug into to see what we can do. Well, at once upon a time, a, a state job uh, that was relatively low, average to low paying was um, balanced out by the fact that the benefits were great so and you had capers you had health insurance and but the the health insurance now the the um, employee portion of that is high and um, you know the issues with capers and and then you know the last administration uh, was was trying to cut back on state employees so um, in, in, uh, it, it, and it's reflective of what's going on in the rest of the state. Unemployment is very low and you know it, w we need people. We, we need people to fill those positions. Hmm. Uh, in, in a lot of different uh, parts of state government, we will train someone like prison guards. Exactly. Uh, awesome. Train them and then the, the local government in the area will hire them away. Uh, we run into that in in the Lansing Leavenworth area, and we saw sure. that, and, and we we are seeing that not only at Lansing, we're seeing it at El Dorado, we're seeing yes. it just about every, everywhere. And when you saw the pictures here in the papers that were released by the Department of Corrections, no wonder so many are leaving, and that's right. And it's not just corrections; it's it's, it's happening with it's um, with hospital and uh, surveyors. Uh, you know, they train them to. They train nurses to go do the hospital inspections, and the hospitals will hire a nurse away. So um, it, it, it's a, every, every part of state government. Wow, that's great. You have one more thing. Yeah, one, one other thing. You know, color. our ending balance is nine hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. and we made a promise to make this payment. Right. We need to make this payment. That's what the gentleman there, if he works for the state of Kansas, expects, and that's what we need to do. Okay. Any more before we go on? Okay, well, go ahead. Can Sarah. I reply sure, on ca ahead, capers Susan. just just a sure. little bit? We, go right ahead. we 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 were uh, assured uh, the, uh, of the uh, safety of the dollars, but but we were warned that you know we need to get this up to a safe 
uh, a safer percentage in, uh, in case of a recession. We never know when that's coming. And I will mention one Seems other thing. Coming. If we get this payment through and the governor signs it, it'll be the first time since 1992, first time in 25 years, we hit the actual required contribution. Wow. First time. Wow. Harvin Hayes, you're next on Kansas Legislature with your uh, with your question. Go ahead. Harv? I don't think we need, I don't think we need to uh, re-amortize keepers. It'd be kind of like buying a house on a 30-year loan. You get to the year 27, you re-amortize it again, and then you get to start all over on it. You're absolutely right. You won't get any disagreement here, I don't think. Well, what, one of the things I think that would be important for folks to keep in mind, though, as you hear words about reamortization and such, the, the presentation and appropriations for the House from the director of, the, of CAPERS did talk about it. As a part of the CAPERS board, uh, as I understood the presentation, every three years, that's part of what they consider as a part of their due diligence uh, in, in their processes to determine whether reamortization ought to occur. So it's not like this came out of the blue in terms of the, the conversation about it occurring. And apparently part of the concern is always that you want to make sure that your employers in the state know that their contributions are going to be a steady amount for planning purposes. And if you, if you're, if you don't reamortize in some circumstances, you can cause some real volatility from year to year for those employers. So that, that's part of the, the consideration that goes on from the, the CAPERS board in, in carrying out their fiduciary responsibilities. Well, and he also said the, the last time that CAPERS was refinanced and restructured was 93, and we're, it was for 40 years. So we're at the last 15 years of that, those payments. Just like with your house, when you get to the end of your loan, you start to pay more principal and less interest. And so putting money into CAPERS will help us continue to do that, re refinancing it uh, and that 30-year loan is truly remortgaging our future. We looked at this, for, well, Governor Brownback had, uh, had us look at this a uh, year or two ago, and it was just, right now, if we do th and re amortize it'll cost $7.4 billion. That's what it costs. That's a, that's a low figure, though. That was and a low figure. And it's gone figure. even more, uh, higher, some other people. But as I, as I understand what he was describing is when, if we pay this off, we will re amortize at some point in time. Th this will never be clear of debt because of that consideration of trying to balance out. So we, we just need to keep in mind that it's not a matter of it will never happen. At some point in time, that's part of the consideration for the CAPERS board. Oh, they always look at it. And at a point in time, it might make sense. But, you know, we're getting, to, we're getting to the point, if you looked at these charts when he brought them in, we're getting to the point where it's going to start leveling out. And we'll get to a point where from year to year, it'll only go up like Two two million dollars. I mean, it, it's it's going to level off, and then it starts to drop off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we could stay on course by 2033, right. we'll have the unfunded taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't have any more calls. One thing I want to point out to you: one 337 4788 1-800-337-4788. This isn't dry stuff. This is up to. This is your show too, gang. So talk to talk to us here. 1-800-337-4788, 1-800-337-4788. Let's talk now about uh, some Medicaid bills that were introduced. Uh, Governor Kelly introduced her expansion uh, of, of Medicaid into the House and Senate. Uh, the measure is a slightly updated version of a Medicaid expansion bill passed in 2017. Uh, it was vetoed by Governor Brownback. Are you willing to just go around the table and if you've seen that bill at all, what's your thoughts? I haven't seen the bill, but okay. what I do know is we're having trouble meeting the needs of, of medical needs of Kansans right now. There's a, a shortage of doctors. Adding more people will just make the, the shortage and waited, waiting time longer. So we need to fix what we have now in order to expand anything and make sure that we're giving good medical care to all of Kansas. They were short of doctors, we're, the, the waiting lists are terrible, and, and then the um, reimbursement is way behind. So we need to try to get our ducks in a row before we And how are you, how, what, what, what sort of that. ducks do we need? Do we need mallards or what, <laughs> do we, what do we need here, Bart? Uh, 
like I said, they, we just need to figure out how to be getting people uh, reimbursed. We need to figure out the, the doctor shortage, which I'm not sure that that's an easy fix. But those are things that we need to, to straighten out as opposed to ducks in a row. So no ducks, just okay. straight, straightening okay. how the process goes. Uh -huh. Susan. So I, I've seen the bill because um, I serve on the, uh, I was appointed to the governor's task force um, on, on Medicaid expansion. Um, the bill looks a lot like the, the bill that we passed in uh, both houses mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and, and that Governor Brownback uh, vetoed. It does not have a work requirement, it has a work referral in it. It also has a, um, a, a uh, piece in there that would keep people on there um, if they would qualify for the expanded population it, it would keep them on their employers insurance as long as they pay um, two percent of that mm. and, and that's a that's a, a nice little um, addition to that so that we don't have people going off of their uh, insurance uh, and, and getting on to Medicaid. Um, it also has w what I call the poison pill, which says that if we ever, if the federal government ever drops below 90% of their uh, match rate, that that we would be out, out of the expanded population. Um, you know, for me, I, and I, I, I'm, uh, I've been working on this for several years, and um, it, it's these people are already being taken care of. It's just they're being taken care of in the emergency rooms, which right. is the, not the right place for them to it's be seen. It's too expensive. It, the, the emergency room is yeah. too expensive, but it, it's the expense falls on the hospital. It falls on the hospital, and that and that creates pressure on, and especially on these county hospitals that that aren't privately run. There, and that's that adds to their taxing situation. Right, right. Yes, it does. So, um, it you know the. It has to be dealt with at some point where either we expand Medicaid or the local communities need to raise, raise pro property tax to keep their hospitals open. Or, or the, the other option is the hospitals close. Or the hospital closes. I, I, don't, I don't know if this particular bill is, is the bill, but we are out of time to fix this particular problem. And particularly in rural Kansas and the rural areas, we're seeing tremendous challenges to the drops in our population. The, the expectations mm -hmm. out of Wichita State University is we're, leave, we're bleeding out population tremendously. Um, we, our hospitals are challenged, our schools are challenged, our courthouses is incredibly important for us. We have to capture that population and we're out of time to deal with because healthcare is central to all of those. So whatever we do, it's not a time to move it on down the road because it's a it's part and parcel of all of these things, and I, I would encourage people to keep track of the Rural Revitalization Committee that yes. is, um, has been formed this year in the House. They're, they're looking at these issues, and, and we don't have time to deal with them down the road. We're going to have to deal with all of them right now, or we're going to look around one of these days, and, and we won't have half of our population in, in the rural part of the state. Yeah. Steve from Gove, you're next on Kansas Legislature. Go ahead. Good evening. My question for the panel tonight is uh, what's your feeling on the uh, uh, possibility of the governor's proposal to fund uh, the education uh, bill or the education no, part of the Supreme Court's uh, decision on the inflationary factor? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, where are we on that uh, on that uh, little number? We've it's got a, you've got a, uh, the uh, the governor has made her budget uh, decisions known. Uh, it uh, would uh, take that situation away from the from the courts. It looks like it would be a a process that would uh, make it more amenable. Your thoughts, gang? What? People are looking at a at a way to get this resolved through settlement. I what people lose track of, I in my opinion, is this is a lawsuit. The, the whole education piece, and it's a poly... Let's remember, you're, you're the only lawyer here. It, well, and, <laughs> you know, and, and having, having been involved in litigation for the last 30 years, you can you call this, and it has a lot of incredibly important policy considerations involved, but at the end of the day, it's still a lawsuit with a plaintiff, a group of plaintiffs and a, and a mm -hmm. defendant, and lawsuits get resolved, and they get negotiated, and they get people in the room, and you talk about it, and you find a resolution, and that's where this one will end up as well. So, you know, the floating balloons about information about it right now is, is more a matter of, of seeing what the headlines are, but 
The, and it's and it's really not very productive when you get down to it either. No, no. But it, but there, this will get resolved, and people will get in a room, and they'll talk about it, and they'll find a spot. And and there's never a winner, and there's never a loser. You you just get stuff resolved, and we can get back to a spot where people look at the state of Kansas and say, it's calm, it's secure, it's stable, and we want to be there. Whether it's by families or by companies, we need the stability back in this state. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a big issue, for, uh, as you said, in terms of having companies want to look at small towns especially to try to move even into a, say a Hutchinson or a, a, great, a God City, Hayes, what have you, to try to move to a city that size and, and put a few people in into a, an employed situation. Yeah, and, and regardless of, of how this shakes out in regard to the education piece, just the stability of not having it going on if they can look at the state of Kansas and see us not in turmoil about whatever issue you, you choose, it seems to me that stability is what we're really, we need to be seeking right now. Spoken like a lawyer who goes into a lot of, who settles a lot of lawsuits. I think, I think everyone is in agreement. We, we want to just get this lawsuit behind us. We want to get it settled. And, and I think uh, uh, you're exactly right. You know, we get into folks in the room and come to a number that everyone can live with and move on. Mm -hmm. and, and this lawsuit's been going on for how many years? Longer than I've been around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 20 years or yes. better? And, well, you, and you've, you've had three stints in the legislature on and you've gone on and off, haven't you? This is... Oh, no, 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 no. no. Okay. no that was oh, that's Rick. Yeah. Rick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got two I got two you can do. Yeah. Rick, you've been through this on and off and on and off. <laughs> you've been through this in, in non-lawsuits and lawsuit periods, so yeah. And, and where we're at with, uh, with process-wise, with uh, education funding, it, on the House side anyway, is that um, appropriations is, is uh, meeting and having informational hearings right now, waiting for the um, subcommittees, uh, to the budget committees, to do their work. And the K-12 budget committee is, is putting together a budget then that they will present to appropriations. And I think we'll start hearing about that. It, uh, the week after next. Mm -hmm. Jan from Hayes, you're next on Kansas Legislature. Go ahead. Jan, go ahead. I have a daughter. Got it. Yeah, I have a daughter with a physical disability. She lives in the home with me. She's in her early 30s, and she's, she's been on Medicaid, and I've always carried her on. I'm a nurse, and I've always carried her on my Blue Cross because so many providers in Kansas don't accept Medicaid, don't accept Medicaid patients. And it's frustrating to me. And most recently, um, I quit my job because of medical situation of myself, and I ended up going on the COBRA program. And um, my Blue Cross made a mistake and told the provider that was purchasing equipment for my daughter that uh, Medicaid was to be billed first. And so I ended up being drugged into paying the COBRA for my Blue Cross for several months because she has an out-of-state appointment and services that need to be provided and i'm uh, i'm just not sure that if kansas is an easy state to live in to best meet the medical needs of people with special needs that's good get your reaction to that thought Very kansas true. isn't a place for special needs people what's that's what well saying, i yeah. i think that um that actually our our um the care for our special needs it is you know, we do a great job, uh, and that because of that, uh, people move to Kansas, and that's why we end up with a long waiting list. And and we, we'd like to get rid of the waiting list. Your issue uh, sounds like maybe you need some legislative help, and and your representative is right here that we can we can get her pointed in the right direction to to maybe help you out with that. But um, the the real problem with Kansas is that it. So many providers don't accept Medicaid because the reimbursement rates are so low. It's just, uh, they, they have to, uh, not only are they, they reimbursed at very, very low rates, but then they have to fight to get the, uh, the, get the dollars yes. from the three MCOs. And we're working on that. Uh, like, as mentioned before, I sat on the, the uh, CanCare Oversight Committee, and we're working on trying to smooth that process so that the, the um, uh, providers don't have to fight so so much for every penny but even with that until we have some some more money freed up in the state to put towards re Medicaid reimbursement you know we're one of the lowest in the country in what we pay our providers and that that's sad 
But I, I hope she is getting good care, and um, I, we, we do hear, we have good feedback on the care that they get. It's just the pain that, that's very difficult to We can to do access. a better job. That's yes, a, we definitely, uh, we, we need to do better. And, and the waiting lists, are, to me, are unacceptable. It is. You're right. That's the story. Unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Uh, Sarah and Salina, you're next on Kansas Legislature. Sarah. Sarah. Okay. Hi, My Sarah. Go ahead. Is what is your uh, deci decision on the border wall? Well, that's a. Fe I had to say this, but that's a federal matter, and that's going to have to be decided. I think by you might want to talk to Congressman Marshall uh, in his office in uh, in uh, Washington D.C., ma'am. That's all I can really say. I can tell you that as a reporter because I'm, I'm these folks. That's one thing we don't have to tackle. That's one thing you don't state. have to tackle, right. I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for your call. And while we've got a minute here between calls, I need to throw my annual, my semi-annual, whenever I come on here, sales pitch. It's halftime, as I like to call it. <laughs> and at halftime, I like to talk about having a membership to Smoky Hills Public Television. Folks, you really got to help out and support this organization. I've been with it around ever since this thing started long, long ago when they were digging dirt out, of, out south of here to put in a transmitter. Uh, and I've been a supporter. I did one of the first pledge breaks here. I mean, I've been around here and been a big supporter. And for $60 a year, you get one of the coolest little benefits you'll ever, ever get. And that is a membership to the SHPTV Passport. And the Passport gives you now, with streaming video, it gives you almost practically unlimited streaming video of all the cool stuff you've ever seen on public television. I mean, good old Mr. Rogers from way back when, and Downton Abbey, and upstairs, downstairs, and all the cool stuff that public broadcasting has been known for. It's just great stuff. So would you please, please, when you're done here, go online, shptv.org, shptv.org. 60 bucks a year. It gets you the passport, it gets you the membership guide, it gets you the uh, a special, uh, special stuff, it gets you invitations into all the cool events that Smoky Hills does. It's great stuff. So help them out, okay? Okay, now we're done. Noah from Hayes, you're up next on Smoky Hills Public Television and the Kansas Legislature. Noah, go ahead. Yes, so a couple things here. Um, first one is just, I know you guys covered Kansas Medicaid expansion or the Medicaid expansion coming up. And I just ask that you guys really look and do your homework on that as from my understanding and everything I've learned, it's yes, a lot of dollars will be spent on our end but a lot more revenue and job opportunities uh, from bringing providers and things like that from the federal government will help uh, just bring more back into our state here. And just also look to see what it's done for other states to see if they're flourishing and, and what can we learn from other states that are currently on Medicaid expansion. My next, but my question is to see if you guys are gonna help look at the contracts currently with DCF. Um, right now I know they've contracted out to uh, the state of Florida and um, want to see if you know if you guys are truly going to look to see if we can keep that more in-house and one example i'll use is um other states like the state of new jersey recently came in and uh skyline enterprise and took over some elderly homes and uh it really wasn't in the best interest for the people that we serve so i'm just wondering if you guys are going to look into that and try and keep that more in-house with like saint francis ministries thank you Thoughts, anyone? So that's uh, that mm -hmm. falls on my committee with children yep. and seniors, and uh, um, so the the where the contracts stand right now, it, they're on hold. Um, we're kind of waiting for the new administration to uh, to settle in and let us know what they would like to do. Uh, currently, the two contractors, there are two contractors that provide foster care service in the state: uh, St. Francis and KVC. And um, they, then the outgoing administration had let contracts um, that they were going to provide grants to the contract to the contractors. There were five, and yes, you're right. There was one from Florida that uh, had kind of a troubling background. So um, we're 
We just spoke with the secretary in front of committee uh, this past week, and uh, she's, she p promises that she will get back with us, but we really don't know where that stands uh, just yet. We are hoping to bring some of that back in, um, but you know, that we could potentially face um, a, a lawsuit because the contracts were already um, allowed with, the, with those five uh, private companies. Um, Let's see, he asked another question there that... Uh, he asked about, yeah, I think he more, more or less had a con contract. Comment. Contract. Yeah. And a comment. About, the, uh, about the contracts, yeah. yeah. So that, that's kind of where it stands right now. The, um, the, there was a um, child welfare task force that's been working for 18 months and just completed their, re their, um, their job and, their, and uh, gave a report and recommendations in December. And um, so we are... The, our, our committee is focusing on their recommendations and using that as a roadmap for reform. And uh, so we'll be, uh, we're not going to try to tackle all of it, but we're going to be um, taking pieces of that and, and improving our child uh, welfare and foster care system in Kansas. I hope that's a good answer. Larry from Ulysses. Larry from Ulysses, you're next on Kansas Legislature. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Larry. Thank you. Uh, all Great of name. <laughs> West, all of us in western Kansas uh, can pretty much agree that we're interested in water issues, we're interested in economic development, and we're interested in wind power in more recent years. Uh, this is a, uh, mic um, not a micro problem, but a uh, larger problem than trying to tie those all together. I know there's been proposals that have been made in past years. I don't know uh, whether these folks would have the opinions they would like to express of how to tie together transfer of water from northeast Kansas to western Kansas, which is obviously uphill, but we have excess water that would be available. We have excess wind power that would be available now that could be of assistance to do that relatively cheap, but uh, it takes a good deal of infrastructure and will to tie all of those together to bring stronger uh, agriculture, economic development to western Kansas. So if you'd like to express your opinions on that, I would be interested. So, so Larry, are you talking about maybe a transfer of, a transfer of wind power in the west for water in the east? Well, there are times that the wind power is not needed anywhere, so those uh, are shut down. And there would be wind there to run them, but if you were transferring water from uphill, from east to west, you need power to do that with. So you could go ahead and run that wind power to do that on an intermittent basis, store the water in uh, a series of reservoirs, and uh, eventually get it here. So. Uh, Talk a little bit about that. Okay. I don't. The idea has been expressed, maybe not in front of your committees, but in past years, the legislature. Well, you know, you've had you you're, you're sitting in here. Yeah, you got water. That's we've had water situations in Hayes over the last few years. It's always been one of those things that's talked about. Is I can't we run a pipeline from eastward? eastern yeah. Kansas to western Kansas that, or an aqueduct. Yeah, or an aqueduct. It was, it was what came out of the yeah. Water Congress. There's all sorts of good ideas. The problem with wind energy is the storage of wind energy and it's also the transmission lines can't hold all of that energy going through. So it's, it's a, a tricky situation and I know that the utilities are trying to figure out the best way to deal with it. But we can only store wind energy in batteries. And you, so that's why they shut down. Um, they either have to be transmitted right away or it has to be stored in a battery. And we don't have batteries quite large enough to store it and transfer it. What, one of the things, and you kind of point out this in a peripheral way, um, is we are challenged, and this goes back to a question from earlier on about staffing in, all, in lots of the different departments for the state. 
Um, you, whether you're talking about, I saw a report just came out this afternoon talking about transportation department mm -hmm. and their challenges in staffing. We know commerce department has challenges in their staffing. The, the prison system and the foster care and even our state hospitals are challenged tremendously in that regard. And when your staffing starts getting down, all you do is you respond to the immediate concerns and problems and the, the ability to plan and to reach out into the future. Uh, suffers and I think what we've been hearing in a lot of the reporting in a lot of the committees regardless of where we're at is reports from some of the new uh, secretaries coming on trying to get their arms around their new departments but I think folks that's what we're going to hear early on here is uh, without the staffing levels in these departments it's going to be difficult for us to expect anything more than status quo and dealing with what we have and if we expect people to reach out and branch into other areas and, and be progressive in that regard uh, we're going to have to be looking at some additional bodies because the the small number of bodies in all of these departments um, are not going to get those additional projects uh, new tasks new uh, new items new programs uh, proceeding and as, and as we look at, you, know, you, you were telling me before we went on the air, you, you attended one of the sessions of uh, the uh, Rural uh, Committee. Rural Revitalization. Committee. What's your thought on that? Uh, they've uh, they've got quite a challenge in front of them. Uh, Representative Don Heinemann chairing that, and Adam Smith as the vice chair, and they've done a tremendous job already this session. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we were on pro forma today, but that particular committee was working, and they had a full hour and a half presentation tackling issues in regard to economic development. Today, they were hearing the issue of broadband, and I'm I'm a little surprised we haven't received a phone call yet this evening with somebody wanting to know about. Uh, about broadband uh, and how we're going to deal with that in the rural areas because that feeds right into what everyone here has been talking well, about so that's far. A big, that's a big issue that, the, that that's had being even handled at the federal level because of the FCC. They're, they're working with incorrect, from what we've been hearing from Senator Jerry Moran, they've been dealing with incorrect information for years on, on what, mm -hmm. what really is out there in terms of coverage. Right. So it's... Larry, uh, one, one other thing on the aqueduct. I, I did have an opportunity to visit uh, northeast Kansas where they were talking about maybe storing water and, and there, there are a number of issues there. It's not as simple as saying we want to go up there and get water and bring it down here. Right. One of the places yeah. that they were looking at putting this reservoir in is right in the middle of the reservation, the Native Americans. Yeah. And, and I can tell you from visiting there, they do not want <laughs> and so there, there are many issues, uh, you know, in, involved in the, uh, the, the uh, aqueduct or whatever you're going to call it, because the cost, not only that, uh, and like Brad mentioned, uh, finding somebody on staff that, that they would hey, have time. There's an old saying. There's an old saying of Mark Twain's that that whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. No. So that's <laughs> we're always going to be stuck with. We have a lot of people that watch us via uh, satellite and streaming. And I think this is somebody here from Olathe. Hi. Uh, Vanessa, you're on the air with us on Kansas Legislature. Go ahead. Uh, yes. I'm calling about the Prison Reform Act. What chances of good time going up for non valid ballot offender? None. Well, say that again because we couldn't hear over your... She, she to turn, your TV down. turn your TV down, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm asking about the Prison Reform Act. Prison reform. What's the chances of good times <laughs> going up for nonviolent and violent offenders? Oh, what about violent and nonviolent? Good, good time. Good time for violent offenders, nonviolent offenders. I, I don't know specifically about that, and, and I have heard, obviously, our, our Corrections Committee are working on some of these items and some of the, the general discussion in regard to prison reform. We. Part of what we did here in appropriations just recently, I'm sure they've heard it on the Senate side as well, is that even we have new prison uh, construction going on, but we'll be full again as soon as that is uh, that is uh, up and, and running. So we, we've got to deal with something in terms of how we're dealing with our prison populations, who's in and, and who's out. And, and I don't know what the answer is to that, but we certainly are dealing with a with a crowded situation right now, and there's going to have to be something dealt with in that regard. But I don't know what those specifics might be. And we're, you're already seeing that, that, as you said, a situation with the fact that this is already going to be at, almost at capacity as they open. Well, and the inland. other the other problem that counties have is that we have to be dealing with the mental health of Kansas because 
most of the jails in in the rural areas are basically mental health facilities because these people aren't being dealt with outside of that and then you they end up in jail and if you if you go to tour any of them you'll see the the massive amount of medications that the, these jails are having to give to uh, their prisoners and and so that's another thing we have to look into is the mental health of Kansas. Okay, uh, your calls are still welcome, folks. At, we got about four more minutes, so we'll take a couple more calls. Uh, 1-800-337-4788, 1-800-337-4788. I've got a couple of bottom of the barrel kind of things here that I don't <laughs> want to have to ask. So I told them here, if we get down to the time here, we're going to have to ask them. So let's talk about a severance tax on <laughs> limestone. We've seen an, a bill introduced on ad, having a severance tax where it would uh, occur in the counties where limestone is uh, is being uh, is being mined. Probably right down the road here in Ellis County, for all intents and purposes. Go ahead. I, I, I have no limestone that I'm aware of in Ford County, so I'm going to pass this off to the other legislators on the panel here. They, they might have some uh, more interest in that. Okay. Nobody wants I don't, th to, I don't think anybody wants to I don't think we're really talk. interested in severance tax yeah. on limestone. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think that's going to go on. I, I have limestone mining in my district, uh, but uh, I, I think it's another way to pass it off to the rural area. And I'm. I, th I think a lot of times these bills get introduced and, yeah. and they're just kind of like to poke somebody in the eye with a stick and, and right. I, it, I don't think this is I going think anywhere. I, I, don't think okay. it, I don't think you need to worry about anything. Yeah. 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 We, we have Vanessa right. back from Olathe on the phone. Vanessa, you want to clarify a question perhaps? Uh, well, yeah, I was asking about that Prison Reform Act, about the chances of good time going up. A nonviolent and violent offender. Do you know anything about that? Or? Oh, she didn't hear the answer. I don't think you uh, did, you. did you catch the answer? One more time. Here. Oh. I, I, all, all I can tell you is in regard to the reports we've had from the Corrections Committee or from the Corrections Department is uh, we have prisons in construction right now. We've been advised that those will be at capacity once they are completed. So we, I don't know the answer specifically to your question, but I know we're going to have to do something to deal with population because we are we are out of beds or running out of beds in terms of prison space. So we will have to do something, and I'm not sure what that will look like. Well, I hope that answers your question, Vanessa. I'm sorry. Uh, last thing. Because I and, and I'm this is another hit in the bottom here. <laughs> I just saw that somebody had introduced the 21 members of the House. So I'll ask our House members, and none of you were on this thing at all. That uh, 21 members have uh, introduced a constitutional uh, amendment uh, resolution on uh, anti-abortion, uh, which would uh, key the inalienable right of protection of Kansans and pro prohibit abortion from the beginning of biological development incurred, including fertilization. Any of you heard about this thing? Not other than seeing a headline in regard to mm -hmm. just what you what you read. So no, I, I am completely unfamiliar with what that is. There there are many occasions where certain issues are, are dealt with in the House in terms of people making you aware of those, inquiring about uh, you being involved or Signatures. wanting to be supportive. I have heard nothing about this and did not hear of it going around the house, so I, I'm really not in a position to, to speak to it at all. I didn't hear anything either. And usually you hear it, it filters through pretty quickly, but this was, this kind of went through without a lot of us knowing about it, so. Okay, well that's, that's all I needed to know because I had a lot of people, have, I just had gone, well this is an interesting thing, and I think, but then I went, I wonder who, who uh, sponsored it, none of your names were on it, and so that's, it was probably some kind of a, uh, of a response to the situation in New York, New York. Uh, mm -hmm. but but honestly, in, until you mentioned it right before airtime, I I had not heard anything about it. Yeah, see, I, I mentioned a couple of items just to say think about this just in case we run out of callers, and uh, we've got a couple more minutes left, and uh, we got maybe one more call. No more calls. Um, well, okay, let's go around the table and wrap up here. You got any last thoughts? We'll go around. Uh, well, I, d I was uh, interested that you didn't ask anything about daylight savings time. That was <laughs> kind of in the news. Okay. That's, right. That's All right. exactly well, right. I, I'm sure that I'm sure that those folks in in in, uh, 
in Nebraska and Colorado and uh, Missouri and Oklahoma want to go have another civil well, war with Kansas? I, 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 <laughs> the, the only reason I bring it up is that the, the point I would like to make is that we don't have an option to stay on summer hours year round. At the only option that the federal government gives us is to opt out of daylight savings time, which means that we would stay in this current time where we are now year round. So, and I, that there seems to be a lot of confusion about that in social media. They they don't like the switching back and forth, but right. they would like what they would like to do is be on daylight savings time year round. So, and you're looking <laughs> like you don't want to do that. Uh, well, no, no, I don't. I like daylight savings. I like longer uh, light hours in the summer. Mm -hmm. But what about uh, longer uh, dark in the morning? Yeah. Okay. You're okay with that. <laughs> She's okay with that. Yeah. She's you must, just you fine sound, with that. You know, you know, you know my, my, my old dad would say to me, he says, he's, she sounds like a golfer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, uh, anything else? What? Or, go, ahead. go ahead. Often things are brought to, to the floor and they don't go anywhere past that. So, like Rick said, they. Some are brought up just to poke someone in the eye and see what they say. So it's it's been interesting. It's been fascinating to be there. Well, what, one thing that ago. one thing that I will mention is in the Senate in in our ag committee, there was a bill introduced from Wildlife and Parks to uh, look at increasing fees. And I'm here to tell you, my email's been lit up. Uh, <laughs> The f folks uh, in rural Kansas that like to hunt do not want to see increases. Brad, last last time. The uh, only thing I, I'm a little surprised we didn't get any questions about highways, but it's there's too long a subject to to do in a, in a wrap up. So well, that's, nothing that's, else. There you go. Good, well, good, good, hey, good maybe idea. if you come back next time, we'll be <laughs> in. See you next time for Kansas Legislature. We'll all be back. I, uh, we'll have a new set next week. So join us again. Take care. <laughs>